and welcome to eMentors webinar series. This is a recording of our live webinar. We hope you find the information you're about to view beneficial for your needs, and if you do, feel free to like us or give us a thumbs up. After you've finished watching the webinar, head over to our website, www.ementorprogram.org, to see the lineup for future webinars and to learn more about how eMentor can help you with your goals. And without further delay, let's get started. and introduce our guest speaker. Laura is a best-selling author, award-winning resume writer, internationally renowned speaker, and career motivator. With 12 plus years of human resources experience as a corporate insider at Fortune 500 companies such as Walt Disney Company and America Online, Laura is committing to helping, committed to helping high-achieving mid-career corporate professionals land a job faster. As CEO of the Career Strategy Group, she partners with job seekers to transform their job search results and provides corporate uh, outplacement services to companies that are looking to offer their employees a compassionate, smooth exit. Through experience gained at Disney and AOL, Laura combined her in-depth, diverse HR experience with her skill and love of career coaching to form the Career Strategy Group. Laura now utilizes her contagious enthusiasm and powerful job search methodology to create the perfect recipe for a short job search where she and her team empower their clients to develop proactive, targeted job search marketing plans that increase momentum and achieve breakthrough results. Laura's easy to implement approach has garnered the attention of many national news outlets such as the Washington Post, US News and World Report, USA Today, the Chicago Tribune, and Monster.com. Laura is also the co-author of the book, 100 Conversations for Career Success, Learn to Network, Cold Call, and Tweet Your Way to Your Dream Job, which was Forbes' pick for Best Career Book for 2012. Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. I know our listeners are excited to get started, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you. Oh, so great. Thank you so much, Nikki. <clears throat> I want to thank you first for having me, and thank you everyone for, um, for being on the call today. I'm super honored to be here and uh, have an opportunity to chat with you about one of my favorite topics, really, and that is um, the hidden job market. And when my clients come to me, the, the strategy piece is often their, their biggest challenge. They're, I don't know if any of you would say that you fit into this category. My guess is you would, but when my clients come to me, they say they're applying for a lot of jobs, they're getting a lot of rejection letters, or they're not hearing back at all. And they're getting into this vicious cycle of doing it all again, even though it really didn't work in the first place because they, they don't really have another option or a better option. So today I'm hoping to give you that better option. So I, I could have called this topic, um, instead of advanced job search strategies, it could have been how to get a job without applying for one. So keep that in mind. My goal is going to be if you've spent any time to a lot of time applying for jobs online, I'm gonna shift that. We're gonna have a, have a breakthrough and a paradigm shift today. Um, next slide, please. So as you can imagine, the unproductive search is what I liken to most people's job searches today. They are going after what they see, right? Open positions, their friends may say, oh, oh you need to apply for a job here because um, they're hiring or they're hiring, and um, we're, we're tracking down open positions. In my experience, and I've been doing this now 14 years, I would say that job seekers sometimes spend upwards of 80% of their time applying for online jobs. Sadly, though, the numbers, the numbers um, aren't perfect with this because we, it's hard to get an exact number, but around 5 to 10%, at experts agree that 5 to 10% of people actually get a job that way. So we're spending 80 plus percent of our time applying for something that will work for really only five to 10% of people. So what do we do? What do we do instead, right? So that's what I'm gonna teach you today. The online job search is very high risk, believe it or not. It's high risk and it's low reward. What happens is we spend our time applying for a whole bunch of jobs and we don't hear back and we feel deflated, okay? What I can tell you, however, is that 
and I want everyone to hear me very loud and clear. It's not about you. Okay, so if you're not getting responses, if recruiters are not calling you back, if you've sent your resume to a job you feel was a perfect fit for you, it is not you. It's not you. The job search today is actually broken. So um, I'm going to explain how, in general, to sort of circumvent this unproductive job search, how to make, how to access something called the hidden job market, and make your job search a whole lot less risky and a lot greater reward, especially for the time that you're going to be spending on it. Next slide, please. Okay, so you probably have been looking for jobs through this thing called the visible job market, through job banks or online job boards, online postings, people telling you something's available, maybe even a headhunter listing or a staffing agency posting. But in general, we're waiting for those jobs to come about. Next slide, please. The hidden job market is kind of a, a little bit of a mis misnomer in a way because a lot of people think, um, oh, I got to go for the hidden job market. It's, it's sort of the new buzzword, right? But, or buzzwords, if you will. But that makes you think that they're hidden, right? They're not, a, they're not open. So where do I find them? The truth is, it's not that they're not open or posted, really. It's that they're not available to you. Okay, so next slide, please. Because what happens is job seekers look for jobs in the exact opposite way that recruiters look for candidates. So if you're looking for a job and you're starting with advertising, websites, recruitment agencies, job boards, you're going on the right-hand side of the slide going down, and companies recruit from the bottom up. They start with context that they know. <clears throat> excuse me, and employee referrals and networking and professional associations. So, so we're, we're, we're doing this dance, but we often do not meet. <laughs> Occasionally we'll meet in the middle and those are the, the lucky ones, right? Those are the five to 10%. Those are the ones where the company may be going up and they haven't found that right person. And so they dig in to all of their resumes that they find in their, in their job bank. And then an individual is applying and boom, it's the same day and that's how they get their job. But it's definitely, definitely a mismatched networking approach. Next slide, please. How do we fix this? Well, essentially, we have to reverse engineer the job search. And I'm definitely not an engineer. I'm not even really a scientist in any way, except where it comes to job search, I would say. I have studied the art of science. Um, but we definitely have to reverse engineer how we look for jobs because it's broken, okay? So if you're sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, I've spent 75 to 100% of my job search applying for jobs and I've received so many rejection letters, here's the good news. You're about to actually start a real job search today. So why do I have a picture of, anyone know what that is? I know no, no one can answer me, but why does this professional, this woman who says she's a professional, have a picture of a Cabbage Patch Kid on this slide? And what I'd like to do is introduce you to this new option through a story. I'm going to be giving away my age a little bit here, but in 1978, there was a man named Xavier Roberts who came onto the scene. He was an American art student. He conceived of one of the most popular toy fads of the 80s, my favorite toy of all time, the Cabbage Patch Kid. And as a young girl, I wanted one desperately. And I, along with every other girl in Farmington Hills, Michigan, you know, I thought they were adorable with their little squishy faces, but sadly, parents across the U.S. were flocking to stores to obtain one of these elusive Cabbage Patch Kids, and fights were erupting. If you, if you were around then, you would know that fights were erupting in malls and toy stores all over America because by the time the holidays rolled around, there were none of these cute little squishy faces to be found. However, my mother was in the gift business. She owned a, a toy store. And she had a lot of connections who were also in bigger toy manufacturers. So before the holiday season came, she got wind of these new fabulous toys and she wanted to get one for her daughter. So she called up a friend and she said, hey, when you get these, can you just pull one aside and save one for Laura? And they did. So holiday time rolls around. I'm the only one on my block that has a Cabbage Patch Kid. I'm the new popular kid in town. Didn't last long, but it was certainly nice for that, for that holiday season. And Secure, 
I got one because my mother had a connection. So securing a Cabbage Patch Kid in 1978 is not unlike getting a job in 2020. You could not get a Cabbage Patch Kid if you went through the proper normal channels where all the dolls were sold. If you stood in line at Toys R Us or, you know, whatever the toy stores were of the day, and you waited, I guarantee you, you would not walk away with a Cabbage Patch Kid. Okay, if you liken this to what a job search looks like today, we are waiting at the front door of Toys R Us for those jobs to open instead of finding the connections inside the toy stores to get our hands on a Cabbage Patch Kid. Of course, I'm using this as an analogy for jobs, but instead of going through the front door, we need to learn how to go through the back door, how to find connections inside. Because insiders, get hired. Now, when you, when you have a passive versus an active job search, um, it, it's, it sort of changes the whole entire landscape of your job search because a passive job search is one in which you're waiting a lot. Okay, so if you, anyone on the call feels like you're waiting a lot or you are waiting for recruiters to call back, you're sending your resume to a friend, you are um, identifying online opportunities, you are prime for this new sort of strategy in place. But what I'd like to do is sort of help you trigger going from a passive to an active search. Um, I'll give you another example. When I worked at AOL, um, I worked, we were in recruiting. And at the time there, I was in charge of the college internship program. And there was a young person named Pratik. He knows I talk about him in these presentations. And he was maybe 19 or 20. I think he was still in his maybe sophomore year in college. But he was young and he was determined and he wanted to work for AOL. But we weren't hiring at the time and he wouldn't have been able to work for us anyways because he was a college student nonetheless. But he came in the doors and started to have informational interviews. And he told me from the get-go, AOL is where I wanna be. Now he interviewed with me and with my boss and with several people around the company. And they weren't hiring at the time. That's the key here. AOL at the time was not hiring interns. Um, but he came back the next year when he was a junior. And I know this seems like a long, a long sort of drawn out experience for one single job, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you how this works in your case as well. But what ended up happening for Pratik is when he did come back in the end of his junior year, he had three companies fighting, three, I'm sorry, three divisions in AOL fighting for him. And this was mainly because he identified the company that he wanted to work in. And he said, I don't care if they're hiring right now. I don't, really don't care, it doesn't matter to me. I'm gonna tell them, I'm gonna express my interest because that's really where I need to be. And he disregarded the job openings and he targeted the company, okay? So we're going to, I'm going to go in very linear, granular detail about how to do this. But the first thing we want to stop doing is something I've coined the resume drop and run. And if you've, if you've been in a job search, you've definitely done this. I mean, everyone really has done this, including myself, because it's the way that we interact with other people in our job search until we're told that this doesn't work. The first thing we do is we may say, hey, can you review my resume? If I get it to you, um, just sort of circulate it around. Or can you give it to someone at your company? Or, um, you know, take a look at it and let me know what you think. So I call this the resume drop and run because what ends up happening to this resume? I know none of you can answer, but what happens is usually nothing. Usually this resume will end up in the trash or on someone's desk, uh, but generally it does not end up in the hands of your employer or your target employer. And so what I want you to do is consider that we need something that's a little more effective for getting the attention of our prospects and of our prospective employers than a resume. Next slide, please. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna teach you a five step process for what I call the productive job search. 
And as you, as you heard in the last 10 minutes that we've been talking, once again, the unproductive job search is about waiting, applying, um, and, and hoping that there will come up, there will, something will come up that fits you know, your, your skills and your abilities. But the productive job search is something entirely different. And I know when we promoted this webinar, we talked about a GPS. And a, a GPS is exactly what we need. We need to know where we're going to go. And we really need to know how to get there. And this protocol will help. Okay. So the first thing we do is we create something called a personal marketing plan. So instead of using your resume as your sort of go-to tool, if you will, and I'm a resume writer, so for me to say that resumes are not the most important thing in your tool toolkit is, is a little bit hard to say, but it really is true. The most important document for all of you to be using is something called a personal marketing plan, and I'm going to explain this in detail. Next slide, please. So after this presentation, I will send a blank copy of this to Nikki and she can forward it on to all of you. And I will tell you that when I use this personal marketing plan in my business with job seekers, it transforms their job search almost immediately. Because what we're doing again instead is we're kind of hoping, right? When we sort of hit that ball over the net by saying, here's my resume, we're hoping that someone else is going to catch it and they're going to do something with it. The truth is that usually doesn't happen. And instead, this personal marketing plan is going to help you to teach other people how to help you better. Okay, so you are essentially teaching them what you need with this personal marketing plan. And it's going to create opportunities for you to land high quality leads. High quality leads, that's the goal of this because it enables you to get super specific and clear on what you want out of a job. And it allows you to help your network help you get it. And that's a lot of words, but it will help your network help you get what you most need out of a job search. Okay, so what's on this personal marketing plan, this magic document, I bet you're wondering. Um, first of all, you're gonna, what's great about filling this out is if you can't fill this out for any reason, then you have a little bit of work to do, which is why I start this with every one of our clients. We want to make sure that if there is any, you know, any of these fields that you can't answer, you don't know your target, you don't know your, your level, you don't know um, your industry or company size, um, then we, need, we have a little bit of work to do. But on this form, the most important things are uh, target job level. So we're talking if you're a VP, you're a director, you're a whatever the level is that you're going in at, the target job function. So are you marketing? Are you um, HR? Uh, are you looking to do legal? What is it that you're looking to do? And then geographic location of interest. So this is important because obviously we want to know where you need to get a job. And it helps other people to help you better because they can help you with, oh, I know, I know a company that's out in Laurel or I know a company that's out in Bowie. Um, but the most important thing on this form is the target company list. So when we work with clients, we will ask them about their target lists and they might say, yes, I know I'm targeting, you know, I, I have a target list. And often I will ask and they may have five or six companies. This is where it gets a little tricky because it's really important to actually have a really robust full target list of companies. And I'm going to start by saying 30 to 45 is really going to be ideal. So if you're a target list right now, if you can say, oh yeah, I'm trying to get into four companies, that's a really good start. But we're going to need you to go a little deeper and start identifying some other companies as well. There was an organization called the Five O'Clock Club that research job seeker behavior, and they determined that you need 30 to 45 companies to get one job offer. Okay, so you, you essentially want to know what companies you're targeting. Now, on this personal marketing plan, on this slide, you'll see I have industry one, industry two, and industry three. Why pick an industry? It's really important that either you choose an industry or you choose a company size. Okay, because even though it may not matter 
um, to a job seeker, what industry we're in. You know, I've, I've talked to several of my, let's say my HR managers, they'll say, I can do HR at any kind of company. You give me a manufacturing company or a consumer products company or, you know, a sustainability company. It really doesn't matter to me, but it does matter to the organization. And so identifying the industries also helps you be a really strong candidate in the interview. So again, on this form, what are we going to capture? We're going to capture what is your target job function? What is your geographic target of interest? We don't want to make this too big either. And then what are the companies that you are targeting? Okay, next slide, please. And again, just highlighting again the importance of making it easy for others to help you. So for example, if you have the same person and the first time you say, hey, hey man, can you take my resume and just circulate it around or share it with anyone? And that's sort of option A. And option B is, if you don't mind, here's my target list, my personal marketing plan. And on it, there are 30 companies that I'm really interested in working for. Would you mind taking a look at this PMP and letting me know if you know of anyone inside these organizations? I, I liken this to sort of a tennis match in many ways because you constantly want to get that ball back. Okay. If you keep throwing the ball over, it's, you know, and you're playing tennis on your own, you're practicing your serve or whatnot. The goal is just get it over the net. But if you're playing tennis, you're hoping for a rally. Okay. So if you give them the personal marketing plan to look at, your goal is to get a contact, to get a lead, to get a phone number. It's not to just send them something and hope they do something with it. So I, I, I use it as um, sort of the imagery of you want to get something back. So have them look at your personal marketing plan and say, do you know anyone who works at any of these organizations? And could you make a connection for me? Okay, next slide, please. Okay, once you have identified the target companies, the next step is going to be identifying the people within those target companies. Okay, this is um, really not terribly complicated. It's not, the, it's not a complicated part of the process because we know a lot of people and a lot of those people we probably are connected to on LinkedIn. But I like to carve out different groups of people. So say for example, your family or your close friends or your college friends or your bowling friends and then make several sort of emails, dissect them and then send an email with your personal marketing plan and ask them the question again, you know, hey, I've, I've identified that this is really what I want to do. I want to be in, you know, manufacturing, in HR, in this type of company. Here are the 20, 30 companies I'm looking at. Do you know anyone inside those organizations? And just send it to each of those groups. Now, that's, again, really not that complicated and we can get that list from LinkedIn. Next step, next slide, please. Okay, um, the, again, this is the list of the, for, sorry, the sl step two was the company, step three was the people. So really important to make the list of who do we want to reach out to within those target companies. And one of the things that I do for my clients is I will look at their personal marketing plan. And the first thing I do is I go through and I put each company in LinkedIn. And I will see if I have any first or second connections with anyone inside those organizations. And actually, even though this is time consuming, it's super duper duper effective because you could do that to even 10 people and find that you have connections at these target companies. Now you may say, but then they may not be in the right department. And you're probably right. They probably won't be in the department that you need them to be in, but it's just really important to get in the proverbial door. So even though you may not know someone in marketing, if you're going for marketing, if you know someone in engineering inside the organization, you can get a whole lot of information from them and even a connection after you're done with that conversation. So next slide, please. So step four is really where the rubber meets the road in that a lot of the stuff that we've talked about thus far is really about really can be done on your own, okay? It can all be done without having any conversations, mostly conversations with people, right? Other than maybe getting, you know, getting connected with people. By the time you start spending, um, expending your effort trying to get these informational interviews, that's when 
you're sort of getting out of your own, you're getting out of your own box and you're starting to make connections with people at your target companies. So an informational interview ideally is going to be done, and this is in an ideal world, you're going to want to get meetings with people who are one or two levels above you. And you know, I just mentioned, it's not always perfect. It doesn't always work. But that's going to be the ideal. But let's say you, you know, you're in marketing and you want to meet with someone in engineering because someone knows them. That's okay. You want to get in the door, you want to gain information, and you want to establish rapport. And one of the key tricks that I use for telling people how to conduct an informational interview is asking for air, advice, insights, recommendations, and referrals. Now, there's one thing I didn't say to ask for, and I bet you all could guess it if you were, if you were able to talk to me right now, and that is a job. Do not ask for a job in these meetings. You're probably wondering why. Well, the, the, question, the reason is there might not be a job, right? We may be reaching out to these people in advance of a job opening. If we are, that's the best way to do it. That's the best timing possible is to reach out to them before there's a job open. So let's say you get an informational interview with a target company and you, you know, want to know more about the organization. So you ask them, hey, here's my personal marketing plan. Of course, put that company on the top of the list and say, you know, I really want to get into this organization, just like Pratik did with AOL. And, you know, obviously I'm considering other companies as well. Do you know anyone in these organizations? Do you have any recommendations for me? You look very organized and very pulled together if you can have a personal marketing plan ready to go. And then just keep it in your back pocket. Doesn't mean you have to use it with every person you're talking to, but what's great is that it's available to you and if that person who is meeting with you is, is wanting to help in some way, this is a perfect way to get them to be um, what I call an ambassador for you. Someone who can shepherd you through the process, introduce you to people. Um, even if they don't have a job. Next slide, please. Now, step five, of course, the goal of the entire meat of the job search is getting meetings with people in your target companies. That's the, that's the meat. But how do we continue to make connections? Because sometimes they dry up. And a lot of people in a job search um, will, will get inquiries, you know, join this job club or join this networking association or join this or join that. Number one, lots of money. Um, number two, lots of time is spent doing this. And I've sort of decided that in my experience, there are three professional organizations that any one job seeker should join. Okay, this is kind of the, the litmus test that I, that I use. Number one, I'm going to start with the bottom up. Number one, a job seeker club of sorts. Just because it's great to be meeting people, you know, once, once a week over the, the phone, um, talking about next steps and what it, what it is that you're doing to support your job search. The other two are professional organizations. One of them is with people who do what you do. So if you're in, I'm going to use marketing as an example. If you're in marketing, you would want to join an organization with other marketers. Why? Because you get better when you're with people who are doing great work and innovating and are active in the industry. So join one organization with people who do what you do. The other one is to join with people who need what you do. Okay, so let's say you were to join, um, you were a marketing person and you were going to join a real estate or professional association because your specialty was you know marketing to the real estate industry you may be the only one who does marketing in that association although lately more and more vendors and people who support those industries are in those rooms as well but what's great is you're learning about trends you're learning about um, concerns opportunities ways in which the which ways in which you can serve that audience better so those are the those are the three professional organizations that i recommend any person join it will save you a lot of time if you just join those three and and really get focused on being impactful and being active in those organizations instead of spreading yourself way too thin 
Next slide, please. So once again, to summarize, and then I, I'm going, going to move on to something else, but the productive job search is, again, limit the amount of time you spend applying to open positions, 10 to 15% of your time at most. Instead, focus on target companies and people within those companies. And the key here is whether or not they are hiring, whether or not they are hiring. My clients will often say to me, oh, Laura, someone recommended that this company was hiring and I should apply. And then they sort of giggle and they'll say, I know what you're going to say. I know what you're going to say. And it's true because I really don't, I don't pay attention to who's hiring anymore because sometimes it's too late, you know, if they're hiring. So then your focus is going to be to meet with people one or two levels above you. Oh, real quick. If, if you get someone in the organization who is not in the department, that would be your hiring manager. That's okay. Get in the door or get on the phone, learn about the organization, find out things that are pertinent to the culture, to the kinds of companies and the people that they like to hire information that will help you be a better candidate when you do interview for those jobs. And then conduct informational meetings, ask focused questions, fine tune your targeting strategy, and ask for air, advice, insights, recommendations, and referrals. And do not ask for a job. So you're probably wondering, do I even bring my resume to these meetings? I get that question a lot. And I say bring it, um, but, I, but I do not say share it in all cases. And really because if there is no job, then why would we share our resume if otherwise people are, all they can say is no, right? And they don't like to say no. So sharing your personal marketing plan is so much better because they have an opportunity to help you. If you share your resume, they don't. So I tell people bring it, but don't share it really unless you find that opportune moment. Next slide, please. Okay, I almost ended the presentation here and then I, I added a few things because I think it's really important. I was interviewed yesterday by Forbes um, magazine and I wanted to share with you some of the things we touched on because they wanted to know how to job search in the age of social distancing. And there are a lot of things that you can do to keep yourself busy and productive despite having to be social distanced. For example, if you're just starting your job search, there's a whole lot of soul searching that goes into it before you have to even start your job search. You take time for reflection. You can identify, really get clear on what it is you want to do, what is your target function, your target industry, start researching that industry. Which I'm going to talk about that in a minute. You can take assessments, uncover your ideal job target. You could go down an internet rabbit hole that you, could, <laughs> that you may never get out of from assessments that are free. Um, there are quite a few that are for fee, of course, but there are lots of them that are free. And one of the assessment tools I love the best is called Onet, and it's onet.online.com. And it's a really good first start because you can find hundreds of thousands of different jobs and some assessments and skills, and you can sort of sort the data however you like, and it's great for helping you figure out what you want to do next. Strengths Finder and DISC. There are lots of people who offer those online. Um, you can debrief those exercises with a career coach over the phone, update your resume, refine your pitch, and ready yourself. Next slide, please. In addition, you can become more marketable. So learning classes on Udemy or Coursera or LinkedIn Learning. Um, again, I, I say refine your resume, perfect your pitch. Be virtual interview ready. One of the things that I think will change forever as a result of our current situation is that companies that believe they could not go virtual will go virtual. They will have to. They will have no choice. And I think that Skype interviews and virtual interviews are going to be here to stay. And so scheduling a call with a friend, sending them a few questions to ask, comfortable looking at the camera, where, is your eye, where are your eyes going? What are you wearing from the waist up? <laughs> um, practicing your answers. Really, really good use of your time. And then one of the last things is to cultivate inner peace. I think during this, this moment, which feels like a lifetime, but will ultimately just be a snapshot in our, in our lives um, and on our path, we need to learn, a start, learn how to harness a positive mindset, to meditate, take a mindful walk, create a gratitude journal, 
All of these are things that we need to build into our day and, and honestly need to build them into our job search in general because job search can often be chaotic and maybe stressful as well. Um, but really having, having an inner, inner peace um, time in our day, I think is really, really grounding. Next slide, please. And then the last thing is getting in the know, understanding and if you, if you do the personal marketing plan, you will know what companies you're targeting and what industries you're targeting. And then getting in the know and understanding how this will affect your employer or your industry and company. Proactively setting up Google Alerts for prospective employers and understanding what's going on for them right now. What might they be facing? Signing up for industry newsletters um, from associations, tracking down analyst calls for publicly, publicly traded companies about their performance and understanding the threats and the concerns um, on companies and how they're minimizing their risk during this time. So I, I really believe that there's a lot that can be done. And, and, and one last thing, um, oh, one more slide, please. And one more. For those of you in the middle of the interview process, you, you know, I think this is tough, but a lot of times, you know, you may not hear back, um, it's going to be slower. I definitely think there will be delays, but you know what? Job search has delays built in anyways. I've been hearing for years that my clients can't get a call back or they interviewed and they didn't even get a response or, you know, it's patience is always the key word, I think, whenever job search is concerned. But in this case, I think we have to temper our assertiveness with a little bit of sensitivity. You know, people are learning to get used to this new normal. Um, if you haven't heard back, just be patient. It is okay to be top of mind. I might do it a little differently, you know, by maybe reaching out if they post something on their status on LinkedIn, I might respond that way. Um, you know, using caution when asking about the status of a position repeatedly, they are probably, in most cases, these delays are not going to be personal in nature. And so even though they're frustrating, I can say more than ever that they're not personal. And I know recruiters are doing the best they can. And I've been, I'm on lots of emails uh, from recruiters around this area who have mentioned that you know, they were recruiting for 50 positions, but now they've pared it down to 10. And they're really just focusing on those 10. And so if you don't hear back, it's likely because um, the position's on hold and it probably has nothing to do with you. So, that was it for me. I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. And I just really wanna say, you guys have got this. This is gonna be temporary. And uh, I wish you all the success, continued success. Anyone on this call is already successful. So I wish you continued success. And I'm, I'm delighted to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was excellent. Um, a reminder to the folks that are listening, if you do have questions and answer or questions, go ahead, send them in via the Q&A tool in your toolbar. Again, top or bottom of your screen, depending on what kind of device you're on. I'm also going to quickly send out a uh, survey to each of the, the participants just to help us evaluate how helpful today's topic was. Would you like to see more of this in the future? It just helps us kind of finalize what we do for future webinar offerings. Um, while the listeners are taking a few moments to send in their questions, Laura, I just had one for you. Do applicants, this is something that we see a lot, um, do applicants really have to customize their job resume or the resume that they're submitting to each individual job announcement? Great question. Um, the answer to that is Oh, a resounding yes and no, and let me explain. Um, I would recommend that you get, again, real clear on what it is you wanna do, and then make a resume that will speak to 80% of those positions. So you have to do minimal editing for that resume. If you find a resume, so I'm sorry, if you find an op opportunity that's outside of that master resume, you would probably wanna tweak your resume a little bit, but my goal with my clients is minimize, minimize all of that tweaking, minimize all of those changes by getting really clear by maybe picking three or four job descriptions that really speak to 75 to 80% of the jobs that you would want. And then peppering those, those keywords on your resume and trying to incorporate as much as you can from those job descriptions. And then you can really minimize the time that you spend customizing. 
Okay, perfect. All right, first question from one of our listeners today. Um, she sent this in back when you were covering the PMP. And she, her question is, how does one work this PMP for a data informational security or a cybersecurity for federal agencies? How would you suggest she kind of pairs that um, into her situation? I'm guessing because the question is, I'm not sure if I understand. I mean, you could put like a CIA on your resume or, and, and you know, informational interviews, those companies, people still do those informational interviews. Um, they're just not going to be sharing um, any kind of confidential information. I mean, I, I have a lot of friends who work for the CIA, and I know that they're still doing them, but they're often just being very, very careful about the information that they share. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I, I genuinely do not believe that you, you have to avoid informational interviews because you work for a company that has sensitive data. Um, but they, they just are probably not going to be too upfront about what it's like to work there and what specific projects they're working on. They probably would prefer to do something over the phone versus getting you in the door in those type of circumstances, but it can be done. Um, what you said actually um, is leading us into the next two questions people have about informational inter interviews. What if a company is remote? How do you suggest they set up an informational interview? Great question. Thanks, Elizabeth. I would say um, sending an email, I'm sorry, sending a LinkedIn request um, to the individual. Let's say you know them from, from a friend and they're introducing you to someone else. Ask to just get on the phone. Ask to do a quick Skype interview, you know, an informational interview. One of the things that people say that the reason they do informational interviews is that they like to talk about themselves. I know that seems strange, but if you're asking them for advice about how they got to, their, to where they are in their career and what advice would they have for, you know, someone in their situation, they, they like to help the next generation. They like to help people for the most part. Now you're going to get some no's. But I think asking for a phone call or a Skype call um, is absolutely appropriate and actually only appropriate right now in this circumstance. You're not going to get in-person meetings at this moment. Thank you. I think that also answered part of the next question. Um, there's a two-part question here coming up for how do you adapt this search when targeting jobs in public administration or government positions where usually hiring managers are in the dark and all jobs have to be advertised? Okay, let me answer that one first. Um, so that's true. Federal jobs all have to be posted. That's very, very true. Um, but that does not mean that you cannot get in the door as a referral, okay? That is definitely a, a miss, sort of a myth, okay? And even when you're posting jobs, and I don't, I don't know um, if you've ever seen this, but if a job, a federal job is posted for a long time, they don't have someone inside that they're considering. If they post it for a short period of time, they often do. And so when they're posting it for a long period of time, they are looking for candidates. They don't have someone in mind. That's the time when you say, okay, who do I know at this organization that can help me understand the nuts and the bolts? Who can potentially get me to speak to someone who knows anyone that is surrounding the hiring manager? And the, the, the target approach is really not that different. The only thing that's different is that companies in the public, sorry, in the private sector, they don't have to post their jobs. Um, but federal, you know, the federal does. Um, but again, still you can get connections, you can get in the door as a referral. I almost got a job at the CIA and my, and my, um, my time frame was so collapsed because my friend just said, this is the perfect person and they were hiring for HR and they just, I, I went and interviewed in a couple weeks. And so it's because you know, I was a referral. So don't, don't be misled to believe that just because all the jobs are posted that you can't be referred in. You can. Yeah, I think that's a great answer too. And I find that a lot of people, once you do have a, a, a very successful informational interview, they're likely to let you know when they know of a position opening up. So in this situation in the federal government where they have to post things, um, that individual might say, hey, this is coming out in the next five, 10 days, or whatever the case may be. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking over. We've got a bunch of coming in by the chat here. 
Um, would you recommend, so I think you kind of answered this, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask you again. Would you recommend this approach to government job seekers as well? The answer is yes, absolutely. Okay. Everybody, everybody, yep. Okay, good. And then one more here from Jay. This is slightly different than two hour job search by S. Dalton and your tweaks are better. You mentioned Skype interviews. Where would a person get coached to do visual, visual interviews? Do you have any resource recommendations for that? You know, that's so great. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a fan of Steve's as well. I know his work and um, I have that book actually in my, <laughs> in my house right now. So that's a nice compliment. Thank you. Um, you know, Skype itself, I know, um, teaches, has some webinars that can show you how to do interviews. But what I can do is I can search um, my archives and send you, Nikki, a couple of links for great resources that I think can help people with Skype interviews. Obviously, there are career coaches all over the world that are, you know, happy to support you through how to do a Skype interview. And you can do that, obviously, over Skype. I think the best way to do a Skype interview or to learn how is to do one which means um, learning how to get onto Skype and then practicing maybe with a friend or practicing with someone else, you know, sending them an email with a whole bunch of questions and then just going ahead and doing it and recording it and watching yourself back. But again, there are lots of resources out there and I would be happy to send Nikki a couple that I think are really valuable. Thank you, Laura. One last thing I wanted to cover for um, you when we set this up, you were saying that your services would be discounted to anybody that participates in this webinar. Do you want to go ahead and offer the information they need for that? I do. Thank you. Um, normally, I, I, don't, I don't do this kind of a discount, but in the current environment and also I just really want to be of, of support to everyone here on this call, I'm offering a 15% discount off of all of our services um, sort of indefinitely until things, uh, <laughs> actually you guys will always get them. This is an e-mentor discount. Um, so whenever you need help, just call me and let me know my, my, uh, information is on the last slide. Okay, great. And I'll go back there right now, just so folks know where to find you. We had one more question pop up, Laura, and that's from Mario. What should you do if you are unable to connect with someone in a specific organization? I have tried networking with people um at McKinsey, Bain, and BCG, and most people would not respond. Yeah, I bet they will now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you might want to try again. Um, but the other thing is, Mario, I would try a couple of things. Um, number one, I would go onto LinkedIn and I would identify 20 to 30 people inside that organization, just names who you would like love to meet okay and then i would go and set myself a google alert for all of those people and if you don't know what a google alert is google alert is basically telling the media um, to send you a daily sort of email with anything about those people in the news i might even make it bigger maybe 30 people right and What's great is I get daily, I will get emails of my clients, my corporate clients, my job search clients, so I know what's going on with them at all times. And once, let's say you get, you know, this week someone's quoted in something, or they're speaking at a conference, or they're you know, just mentioned in some way, or the company's mentioned, take that information and use it. You know, send an email to that person and say, hey, by the way, I saw that you were quoted, or I, you know, I hope this was a great presentation. Um, people they they love to talk about themselves but if they're busy of course they're not going to respond but if you if you make it more personal and about them then they would they're more open to listening so i would just set google alerts stay stay on top of what it is that they're doing you know mckinsey and bain and those things you know not again at this moment but in normal times they're going to be have panelists speaking places you know, different conferences or different chapter meetings those are the ones you want to go to and when you're in the know you can do that Oh, one more thing. I would open up your search because three companies is definitely not enough. So you want to have, they're all consulting firms. So open it up to smaller consulting firms and bigger consulting firms. There's three companies. I don't know what's on your list, but you're going to want to have a few more than that. Wonderful. Well, that answered all the questions that we have today. Thank you so much, Laura, for participating and for offering this webinar. And of course, your discount to all of the attendees today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.
Thanks again for watching. If you're interested in joining eMentor to be the first to receive more information for an upcoming webcast, or if you'd like to find a mentor who can assist you one-on-one -on -one with your personal, professional, and business-related goals, you can join our program by visiting our website, www.ementorprogram.org, or send an email to admin at ementorprogram.org. Finally, feel free to follow along with eMentor on our social sites, shown on the screen. We hope to see you at the next event. Thank you.